<laughs> I'm going to bring up somebody here. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can do that. Pass around that little blue bucket. That's our donation bucket. Thank you so much, Sue. Our current uh, Minnesota Republican Party Deputy Chair, Dave Pasco, is going to say a few words here and share some highlights in the past few years. We are greatly indebted to you, Dave. At least I'm, I am. And uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. Happy to be here. So I'm going to start off uh, with a very important public service announcement. Please silence your cell phones. <laughs> and I, I actually, uh, the last time that the president was in town, I will uh, cop to this, uh, my phone went off while he was speaking. <laughs> just kind of, yeah, I know. So, all right, I'm, I'm admitting this. I did something much worse than anyone else in the room is, so please silence your cell phones. Look at the person beside you and shake your head. Uh, <laughs> Jen Zelensky was standing right next to me. In the room, so... Uh, I, like, I thought I was like, oh my god, if someone else has the same ringtone as me, like, no, that's me. It's terrible. Um, so you know what's wonderful? Not running for re-election. Oh, I got so much more time, I can work on party business, it's fantastic. I want to talk a little bit about what I think about the deputy chair role, some things that perhaps you should keep in mind when you're thinking about who to uh, elect someone else. Um, there's two things that I want to focus on. The first is is the person ready to be in the big chair? Is this person ready if something happens to the chair, chair resigns, get hits by, gets hit by a bus, gets supported to some campaign, anything can happen. Want to make sure that the person who is being elected as deputy chair is ready to kind of go on to the, the nightly news, give a sound bite, make sure everything is going to be well. And you might look at me and say, you know, with his background and his experience and everything, why is Dave deputy chair? He's an idiot. He's terrible. He can't do this. But seriously, with the next person, make sure that there's someone that you can see in a crisis situation because it's probably not going to be an easy handoff. They're going to be able to step into that role and calm things down. The way that our party uh, constitution works is you have to have an election within 45 days. So you have to call a special <coughs> state central election if that were to happen. So a new chair would be elected, but that deputy chair has to keep the wheels uh, rolling in the right direction for the party, no matter what we're doing at that point. Second thing is what is the deputy chair actually going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, what are, how are they going to spend their time? And that's probably what most of you are interested in asking questions about. And please, for the love of God, ask specific questions about what they're actually going to be doing. Because the deputy chair is not going to run the show. The deputy chair is going to be a vote on the executive committee. The deputy chair has responsibilities to everyone who elected them, his delegates or alternates. But are they going to be full-time or part-time? What are they going to focus on when they're actually doing the work? All right, and I'll, I'll tell you what I get paid. I will tell you what I focus on. So then you can kind of keep that in mind. And I can go as in-depth as you want to uh, as, uh, as we're doing this, because I know that this is a room full of party insiders. <laughs> so I get paid uh, $20,000 a year. I do not get paid any expenses. So uh, if I go up to Thief River Falls and do a caucus training, uh, that gas is not reimbursed to me by the party. And that was something that I specifically asked for. I was an adult and I went to the nominations committee and I said, this is what I expect to be paid. This is what I expect my uh, you know, reimbursement to be. And I am a part-time deputy chair. I keep a running log of all the stuff that I do for the party, and it averages out to about 22 to 23 hours a week. Obviously, for the uh, election time, it was closer to um, maybe 40 hours per week, honestly. Right now, it's probably closer to 15. Um, there's not a whole lot going on. I focus my time on training, direct activist support, either by webinars or going around to the state. I work on data, and that's for taking in, uh, giving access to our data center, doing training on data center, you know, letting people know how to create lists and use lists uh, to their advantage at the local level all the way up to the state level. And that's really what I've spent my time doing other than of course showing up to events like this, uh, showing up to places, BPU conventions, CD conventions. I'm sorry I missed uh, a lot of the CD conventions. I've had some family issues and also the Navy Reserves is uh, calling me up, so I've been doing some Navy training stuff, so I won't, haven't been able to be around. So uh, I'm going to miss most of the, or I've missed pretty much, no, every single CD convention. So I'm very, very sorry about that. I, I went to most of them last year and the year before, and so I, I am sorry about that. I will be at State Central. Um, that's what I spend my time doing. And you're not necessarily going to have the deputy chair do all of those same things. They, they're going to they're be focusing on different things, and that's OK. Last question, am I going to endorse someone in the race? I don't think I'm going to endorse someone tonight. 
wrong, I'm not going to do that. Why? Well, they're three friends of mine. Uh, Jim Carson is someone when I was chair of the 5th Congressional District, that's Minneapolis, and uh, the, western, the western closest suburbs. Jim Carson was the chair of CD4, and we did a ton of work doing outreach into minority communities, into uh, different, uh, different areas of the metro that you don't see happen that much. And I respect the work that he does and did. Um, Kip Carson, uh, Kip Carson, Kip Christian. Why am I talking about that? Uh, Kip Christian says, so uh, I came on board the Young Republicans as treasurer on my first day of joining the Young Republicans in Minnesota. There were like eight of us at that point. Uh, we built the organization up. And then Kip took over as treasurer and took the organization to the next level. He aggressively pursues the stuff that he was working on. He figured out other ways to fundraise, to support candidates with the Young Republicans organization. And I really, really respect the work that he did. And then in the 5th Congressional District, Jesse Flieger took over for me after I was chair of that. And, you know, Nancy LaRoche came in, built up the organization after a, a long hiatus of inaction. <laughs> uh, that, that's a long story. Oh, uh, yeah, Jim knows. Um, I, I took it a little bit farther, and then Jesse came on board and did a lot of aggressive outreach and candidate support, specifically for Jen Zielinski, but for all the people on the ballot uh, going down, all the people on the ballot going down to local candidates and everything like that. So I really, really respect all three of them. I know that they work very, very aggressively. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have time for it. I know I thought you were supposed to go to the bathroom or were you super I did. fast? You I did. Oh my god. I, I, I was trying to talk. I usually talk for like 30 seconds and then I sit down. Mary's like, I gotta go to the bathroom. So, I said right. just talk for the full five minutes and yeah. I gotta run to the bathroom. Yeah. All right. So uh, if anyone has questions for me or what I did or what I you know, kind of think about the race that we have. Yes. What's the name of the country you're going to go to? Oh, sure. So I'm, uh, if you didn't know, I'm deploying on Mother's Day, thanks Navy, uh, to Djibouti, which is, a real, which is a real place. I'm not making that up. It's a country just north of Somalia. Uh, it's about 900,000 people. I think the country basically exists to host other countries' bases. So there's a Chinese base, there's a Japanese base, there's a French base. Uh, the U.S. base is on an old French foreign legion base, so yeah, it's crazy. There's there's tons of this. So the the U.S. presence there is mainly for the anti-piracy operations. I'm going to be the base weapons officer. Uh, I took a picture of the weather in my backyard today because in two months uh, it's going to be. I think the average temperature is 110 degrees, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But yes, Djibouti is where I'm going to go. Say that ten times. Fantastic. <laughs> no questions. <laughs> Hey, I just want to thank you for all your efforts and the work that you've done. Um, speaking from Carver County, I can tell you that the feedback that we've been given is that you've done a phenomenal job of responding quickly and with specific information to the question that's being asked. So I just want to thank you for the job that you've done. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. And, uh, I, appreciate that. I know that that wasn't a question, but I will follow up. Here is my phone number, and this is a Google Voice phone number that will reach me in Djibouti. So if you have questions, I will give you my phone number, leave a message, and it will get to me. I might not get back to you with the uh, rapidity that I do now uh, when I'm in your time zone. Uh, my number, my Google Voice number is 612-564-5836. Feel free to text me. I'm, I'll probably be having a bad day, and then someone's going to text me a political problem, and I'll be like, great, all right. My day is not as bad as yours. 612-564-5836. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's the dial of prayer number, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've done a great job as, as, as well. Thank you, you Chair. Uh, what's the time zone change going to be there? I think it's like nine hours ahead. Wow. Might be oh, we, 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 don't, we don't call you on one of Yeah, I'll, I'll turn my phone <laughs> off. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. Well, we, we send you off with a tremendous thank you, and we are looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to say goodbye. So we'll say so long. <laughs> You'll be our first guest here next, next year when you return, okay? Make sure you stay in touch. All right, the three candidates for party deputy chair will each now speak. They have up to five minutes, but again, you don't have to take the full five minutes. You know, I kind of feel like you have to, you know, you got the clock ticking. But if you, if you uh, don't have five minutes, don't, don't have that as a stressor. 
When each of you is done speaking, please take a seat on the stage. When all three of you are seated, I will begin asking questions that have been submitted from the audience. Remember to hold the microphone up to your mouth. It's very important. All right, we're going to start with Jim Carson. Thanks, Mary. Um, and thanks for doing this forum. It's a great opportunity for us to get a chance to uh, um, interact and, and so on. Uh, second thing is I want to thank uh, Dave for his service, both to our country and to the party. It's been, uh, been wonderful working with him. And finally, I want to thank uh, my two opponents. Uh, this has been a cordial and uh, interesting um, uh, contest in that sense. We have we actually have uh, become pretty good friends, uh, you know, even though we're uh, involved in a contest and one of us, only one of us can win. Um, the, I think the decision that the, that the state central delegates have to make in, on the 27th is not a choice between three people, but between three approaches to the job. I have my approach, Jesse has his approach, and Kip has his approach, and it's, they're really different from each other. My, I'll let them speak for what they want to do, but what I want to do is to uh, lead the way toward um, reestablishing the Republican Party in the urban metro. Um, that's the first goal that I have, and I've been working on that for a long time, and in fact, I don't need to hit the ground running because I'm already running. Um, uh, we've already booked um, Cinco de Mayo, uh, which is May 4th this year, as far as when the celebration is in uh, St. Paul, and uh, paid the bill on that. Um, I paid the Roseville bill, and uh, looking forward to paying the Grand Old Days bill on Sunday. And uh, we have other, uh, we've also got the uh, Oakdale Parade booked, uh, that's been, was by Dallas. And uh, so we're moving forward already on these uh, different events that we've been working on in terms of, of outreach. Well, um, my feeling is that, we, is that in the, what we do as a, as a party is we should put forward the best foot that we have and to look good and to talk to people in a positive way in the um, um, everywhere, urban metro and suburban areas as well, and uh, both for festivals and parades. And in the festivals, we have uh, uh, got uh, different things that we're doing there, and uh, tents and so on with decorations that are you know, strong, positive themes. Um, we also have done advertising and so on in the Latino American Today is the, uh, the one publication we've done and just started some work in there. Now, is a parade and festival going to solve the problem? No, it's not even a start. It's barely a start. What we need to do is to, do, is to engage people in the urban core and to talk with them about our principles, our values, our policies, and our candidates. Those are, uh, it's vital that we do that, it, and if we do that, they won't be afraid of us. And that's what, uh, uh, was one of the major problems we had in 2018 was that the Democrats were able to scare people. The, the, um, um, their message about uh, uh, healthcare and pre-existing conditions resonated because it sounded real to someone who'd never heard from us. If you don't hear from somebody, someone tells you uh, that the Republicans are evil, you're gonna believe it. Um, because Republicans have never talked to, talk to you. Now, if we have a little bit of a presence, we can counteract that. And I had, have had many great conversations in the street, on Lake Street this past summer, um, on Grand Avenue, on Payne Avenue, um, in Market Fest in White Bear, you know, I could name a dozen different events and still not cover half of them. And uh, uh, they want to hear from us in these urban areas, but, uh, um, we have to, but we have to keep talking. We may not turn them, but we can at least take out the fear, the fear factor. Um, the other thing that I want to get uh, involved with it, with uh, the party is uh, do more with training. Now, if you look at the history of the party and training, it's been a lot of fits and starts, a lot of places where we've done stuff and then stopped. Uh, if you remember the red uh, BPOU uh, operations manual from 2011, I was one of the people that, that, that was involved in drafting that. And over the years, I've done training at at our committee meetings and so on. I also have done uh, professional training uh, in my work in uh, the electric power markets. Uh, so, uh, but I won't be taking those lessons to uh, very much because they, they, they were brutal. Um, you don't want to have me doing one of those sessions for politics. It, uh, it would be very difficult. What we need to do is get creative about how we train folks to do BPOU operations, campaign operations, and candidate. We do pretty well on, on candidate. We do okay on BPOU, and we don't do anything about training people on how to run a campaign. Um, that's, uh, that's something that comes through mostly through experience. I can teach 80% of what needs to be taught. The other 20% needs to be experience and mentoring. 
Um, I see my, I've got 30 seconds left, and I think I'll just wrap it up there so instead of starting a new topic. Thank you. Great. You can keep the microphone moving. That's your mic. Jeff Christensen. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Jim. Um, and thank you also, Dallas, uh, for being here and recording this forum. This is our one opportunity as our candidates uh, to sit on a panel and show you some of the contrast between the visions that Jim mentioned, um, between the visions that Jim mentioned and how we differentiate in our vision as well as what we, what we pledge to do for you and on your behalf. And, and, and while I really incur and I'm encouraged by this wonderful turnout, there are so many more people who need to hear this message as well, and this video is going to be really crucial for getting that out there. My name is Kip Christensen. I am running to be the deputy chair of the Republican Party in Minnesota, and no matter who you elect, no matter who we elect, we're going to have massive shoes to fill in the man Dave Pascal. That was an incredible term, especially as a part-time deputy chair. I've heard in my conversations and drives all across the state to meet with delegates and alternates, what an incredible asset. I experienced that myself as a congressional campaign manager. Dave was always in my corner, always there to help me get the tools and the resources that the party could provide. And that was, and, and, and I understand from the campaign side, from the activist side, from the volunteer side, what goes into that role. Why am I running for deputy chair? Three things, three simple messages, folks. Experience, relationships, and I'm here and I'm listening. I'm here at this organization, I'm here in Thief River Falls, I'm here down in Houston County, I'm here all across the state. I, my job is professional politics, and that's the experience component. I've worked in every role on a, on a campaign for the outside entities, for the inside entities. I've worked with, for the state party in past cycles. I've worked for all the independent expenditure committees. I've worked for the groups in D.C. that play here in Minnesota. Each of these organizations, whether it's a campaign or something else, has their own lane, their own comparative advantage. Things that they do well, things that they need to do well, and things that they really kind of stay away from and should. The party has its own lane. And in that lane, we have to be the most effective that we possibly can be for you, for our candidates, and for advancing our message and going off to do the one role of the party, which is winning elections. I'm losing all this mic. I'm just going to speak loudly because I can project. <laughs> um, we have a lot to do, folks. We don't have time. There was a question asked of the chair candidates earlier. When the campaign cycle starts, what are you going to do? The campaign, campaign cycle started the night of the election. The DFL never sleeps. We can't sleep. We don't have enough time. We have, as a party, built ourselves into a model that takes a step back does a little self-assessment, a little bit of introspection. I understand that. That's important. That's how you keep transparent. That's how you keep accountable so you can build and go forward. That is important. But we can't take a stutter step. The DFL doesn't, and we can't. We need to keep the pressure on. We need to keep the heat on. We had an awesome operation going in the 2018 cycle. As Jennifer mentioned, our ground game was on fire compared to any other cycle I had seen here working professionally in Minnesota. We did... You can shake your head, but the truth of the matter is we had better voter contacts in this cycle than I'd seen any time in the past. But we need to grow on that. We need to build upon, build upon that. And we need to crush, 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 precinct by precinct. And that's where the party's special. The party is different than campaigns. Campaigns are a little tent that pops up and then goes away when the campaign's over. The party is the house, the castle of granite that we build that we work with each other, that we build the relationships both with those outside organizations and amongst each other. We build these relationships. We build that machine that propels us to victory that stands regardless of the campaign cycle. The party is the house of granite that lasts for years and we need to start building that, not on a two-year cycle, but with a 10-year vision. And we don't have enough time to let the wheels slip. We can't wait until fall to get going. We only have 18 months, folks. I know we can make serious inroads. I know that we can win some pretty important races in 2020. And we can pre preserve the house, suite, say, house seats at the federal level that we, that we did flip in a really cool way. We have never been in a more difficult spot policy-wise. Governor Walls, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, the DFL House majority 
are advancing an incredibly socialist, Marxist agenda, and they're trying to ram it down our throats. They started out with single-payer buy-in at, at Jan 1. They started out with gun rights, gun control, gun grabbing bills. Where are those today at this point in session? They're gone. Why is that? Because they lost the votes in the Senate. We picked up the Senate District Special Election. That was another one of my experiences. It was another one of the races I worked on the ground with people in every corner of this room. Full time, we won that race through good tools, good technology. My time has expired, but we flipped that seat for the first time in 47 years. We are on the march. We are going to continue to go around the state and flip these. If, if you elect me as a full time deputy chair, I want to go around and train and teach and do all those things. Now, questions? I guess we're sitting, yeah, right? We're sitting. I'm sorry. I'm just cutting in my own Thank you very much. Let's go do this. Carry up, Jesse Flieger. Thank you, Mary, for putting on this event month after month, uh, even with this beautiful weather we're having. Thank you guys all for, you know, you could be enjoying a beautiful spring day today, but you're not. You're here. So I appreciate that. I also uh, appreciate the uh, candidates, and I think that we've got a great group of candidates. I agree with Jim and that, that I personally uh, like each one of these gentlemen and uh, enjoy their company. So uh, my message has been going around. Many of you know me. I've been spoke at the event before. But my message going around the state has been one of unity with three components within that. One is one that was already spoken about by our chairwoman, uh, Carnahan, earlier, which is the different elements within the party that don't always work together. And she's right, as a member of state exec, we have started, uh, that I was as well, that we started those conversations and those relationships to work on. We need to continue to do those things and we need leaders that are making that a priority. The other area is messaging, which is something that everybody likes to talk about. Uh, and it's the, the buzzword of the day. But really what that comes down to, and you've probably heard me give this before if you've been to any of the CD or BPOU conventions, which is the easiest way to put it is, and it's not a knock at the candidates, but again, like I joke every time, that's what you say right before you take a knock at the candidates, but we had great candidates, is the last thing we needed to be doing was flying around the state three weeks before the election, talk at, at three o'clock in the morning, landing in Bemidji, talking to the same three Republican activists that are already gonna vote Republican anyway, we needed to be taking that message to the average citizen all across the state, but including in the metro. We need to have solutions to the problems of the day. When one side of the aisle is giving everything away, and our response is we can't afford that, the average person looks at that and says, I'll take that one. <laughs> so if we're not providing a solution, that doesn't mean we need to be DFL light, but it does mean we need to provide, we need to explain how our principles and our policies solve the problems of the day and make their life better because that's what they want. The third area is continuing the great work that Dave Pasco has done as deputy chair in training. <coughs> we've got some BPOUs and CDs that do amazing work and we've got some that need some help. And there's a lot of things as I've been traveling around the state that I've learned that I didn't know that people had these systems and all these little cool things that they're doing and all these, I mean, we've got all the stuff's there. We're just not sharing it and we're not and we're not streamlining it. And the communication up and down in the party, if you haven't noticed, doesn't always work. And, and so that's another area of improvement, to be able to create those relationships and create those tools and those training, th those training methods for everybody across the state. And data is the other most important thing. And I know Dave's done some work in data, but overall, has, has anybody in here that's involved in local party politics ever experienced that their, their data didn't make it through to the system in the state party, or maybe they got asked a couple of six times for the same data over and over again. And that's not, again, a shot at anybody, but it's like, those are things, those are the basics of politics that we need to get about. A message that solves problems of the day, and we have a good ground game, and we've got good data. These are the things that we need to be, and somebody needs to be responsible for those things. So the areas that, I, the, those two big areas that I wanna work on as deputy chair is, is activist training and recruitment and vo volunteer time, and the other is data. And so I've got lit on all the seats. You guys are gonna be able to ask us questions, everything. I'm gonna finish with plenty of time, but jesse4mn.com, and I uh, appreciate you guys all coming and asking great questions. Thank you.
We have some really good questions here. There's about nine questions, and there aren't that many. And there were more questions than that, but they seem to fit that activism, that training, the outreach, so forth. So uh, those topic areas. So nothing is going to take you guys by surprise at all. <coughs> that you can maybe expound just a little bit. I want to ask you something, though. You know, I can remember about 30 years ago, I was a part of a panel that interviewed um, some people coming in to be an executive uh, assistant or secretary, as we called them then. And we never gave them a typing test to see if they could type. Now you think that, you know, that's pretty simple, isn't it? But I, I really want to ask you the first question, which is, is that a lot of this that you're going to do, and that what Dave Pasco did, requires some level of technical savviness. And it also takes some very good work habits, too, follow through and knowing how to communicate and getting it out there right away when it's needed. But the technical savviness, how comfortable are you with social media? How, how good are you at doing, doing the data center stuff? Tell us a little more about that, your actual skills to do some of this. Should we start with Jim? Okay, as far as the social media, I um, actually got paid <laughs> in 2018 for doing social media with a uh, national uh, PAC, uh, basically maintaining and answering stuff on Facebook about the different uh, you know, stuff that was being asked. Also produced a couple of memes that they put out. And uh, it's something that um, I've been involved with using social media since long before it became known as that in the 90s. Uh, it was called bulletin boards back then. Uh, but uh, as far as the other technical stuff goes, uh, I learned to type when I was in fourth grade. Um, and uh, uh, just, yeah, I'm completely comfortable with, this, with, with these things. I used to actually sell computer equipment many, many years ago, so I'm perfectly comfortable with all the technical side of it. we got 90 seconds? Sure. I mean, okay. I'll be brief. Okay. Um, I do this campaign communications technology work either in the background as a ghostwriter um, or a ghost operator for corporate clients as well as my political clients during the professional cycle of the politics. Can everyone hear back there? Am I projecting okay? into the background? Okay, cool. Um, I train people to do this already. I already I already do this as my full-time job in a political context. And the corporate clients, those are, those are cases where I'm doing building media training uh, and media plans for statewide operations, whether it was working for, and I, they probably won't like that I'm saying this, um, working for Enbridge to push through the media plan for line three, working with our PR operations. Um, you know, to do grassroots activism with people in the party to get those messages driven into local press across the state. From a actual technical savvy standpoint, I've been building computers since I was a child. Uh, I, I, I have a server in my basement, not a Hillary server, <laughs> but, like classified intelligence, but it's, it's a lot like that um, in, in effect. Um, I'm trained well in SQL. I know the back end of data center. I know how to and when I don't know how to do something, I have an extensive network of technical friends and people that I've worked with over the course of the years who can help me build the tools. I want to, on a technical side, push our party towards using new tools. Techn technological environment, I'm done with it. Last point, digital caucus. Talk with me later about it. <laughs> digital caucus, let's do it. Uh, like like both of these gentlemen, I've had experience on campaigns. Different. I got to run Jennifer Zelensky's campaign for Congress uh, and had plenty of uh, and, uh, social media there and for the 5th Congressional District as well. Uh, my own personal use, I'm sure I'm friends with probably almost everybody in here, so you've seen my activity on, on social media. Technically, technical savvy stuff, I, I use all these kinds of tools and, and spreadsheets and data and all kinds of things for my job every single day. Um, I also am very familiar because of the roles I've held within the party with data center and other kinds of tools. And uh, I agree with Kip and, and the fact that um, I think sometimes what everybody and good leaders especially recognize is that we don't have to have all the skills and all the solutions ourselves if we surround ourselves with really great people. And that's been the, the, my success in my career, has been my ability to surround myself with uh, the very best and to train and, and give uh, the tools to other people to be able to do even greater things, because I recognize that uh, I don't need to be the best at everything to be the leader. Thank you. How does your experience and background uniquely demonstrate who we are as Republicans in Minnesota? We'll start with Kim. Sure. Um, 
best demonstrate who we are as Republicans? How Can you re that? Yeah, how does your experience and background right. uniquely demonstrate who we are as Republicans in Minnesota? That's a really interesting yeah. take on It is a good question. Um, that's a really interesting yeah. take. Wow. <laughs> so it's really cool because because you can encapsulate so much of what it means to be a self-starter and entrepreneur in pursuing the American dream into kind of, I threw away the corporate path. When I graduated from college, I could have gone into business consulting and, and climbed the corporate ladder and all of that stuff. Um, but I really wanted to hack out and do my own thing and start entrepreneurially going back to Minnesota based on the data and the research that I did in undergrad um, that told me that Minnesota was winnable. I was always, I've always been a political data geek and a nerd in politics. Um, I think that's one of my strong suits. But it drove me back to Minnesota to come back here and help us build machines, whether it's, yes, the YRs, which have been uh, something Dave Pascoe mentioned, um, something that we can use as a candidate recruitment and candidate development tool. Start building those machines, but also working on the campaign cycle. As I mentioned earlier, every political entity on the conservative side of the state of Minnesota, I've worked for them or I've worked with them. Um, they've paid me in some form or another. Um, congressional campaign role, that is going out kind of manifest destiny to western Minnesota and, uh, and, and, and working that race in a way that, in a way that I think a lot of people would have struggled to take on a race that was difficult from the start. I've never, never backed down from a challenge in, a, in, a, in, a, in pursuing my career and pursuing my experience. And I know that we have a challenge ahead, but we can win with work ethic and with some serious boots on the ground driving us. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, a couple things came to mind when you first said that in our background. Uh, you know, I said the best way to turn somebody Republican is give them a couple of kids and a mortgage. <laughs> I have those things. So that makes me very Republican in my nature. Uh, I work for an evil oil company, so I get to be a Republican at work, too, which is very rare. Um, uh, my wife runs a small business out of our house, uh, a daycare, and so, and I kind of get to be the business brain behind that as well, and uh, uh, so that definitely continues to drive me to be a Republican. I'm a country boy who moved to the big city. I grew up on a farm in rural North Dakota. I'm a rush baby. My da I remember vividly riding in the pickup truck or the, or the, uh, uh, or the tractor, um, this thing to rush, because uh, my family was converted from Democrats to Republican by Rush Limbaugh. And so uh, there's a lot of things in my actual background that do that. But then I've also had a lot of the, the great experiences within the, the party, like so many of you. I worked my way up in the Republican Party, and I've hold, held all the positions of treasurer, secretary, chair, all those things. And I've also uh, worked my way up in corporate America and done the American dream of the, of the who came from you know a, a poor, humble beginning and, and have the great middle class lifestyle that so many people strive to do. All of those things are very Republican values and make me the Republican access group. Okay. Jim, do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah, if you, if you could. And just for everybody, how does your experience and background uniquely demonstrate who we are as Republicans in Minnesota? Um, I'm going to take a little different take on that. Um, in, in our family, um, my wife uh, is a you know, bedrock conservative. Her father was a bedrock conservative. And yet, she runs um, and started in a food shelf, one of the most successful food shelves in the Twin Cities, very efficient and very effective at distributing food to the poorest of the poor in Hennepin County. And her father started, was involved with starting a seep out in Brooklyn Center. And um, he was, again, he was a treasurer for local party units at the time. Uh, we are, um, we were uh, child foster care for about a dozen years from the mid 90s to the um, 2000s seven or so and then we're uh, from 2010 till now we're uh, licensed adult foster providers can't tell you the details but basically we take in people who would otherwise likely be on the streets and, and um, begging or something like that and provide them with a decent home and um, uh, it's very unrepublican according to the what people think of but you know as I've gotten involved with with in that world there's a hell of a lot of Republicans that do a hell of a lot of good in the world and we shouldn't be uh, shying away from talking about that. Uh, these, uh, um, you know, the people who donate a lot of money to, uh, uh, the, to these folks are hardcore Republicans. My, my wife is 
taking, um, uh, talking to a donor next week, a large donor about who is a well-known, a hardcore conservative. That one of the people you'd never think would donate to a food shelf, but she's likely to do so. And uh, so I think that's a part of what we uh, should be talking more about is how what our, we live what we say, and we live the, the, those, those, uh, those kinds of things. So thank you. Two questions here, kind of on marketing and messaging, and I'll put them together. One is, what do you feel is the best way to market the Republican conservative brand towards urban voters? What marketing strategies do you believe we need? How will you develop messages? And Jesse, do we start with you this time? Sure. So I think the I go back to what I said earlier and the fact that I that having all the answers, anybody who thinks they have all the answers is, doesn't have any of them, really. So, so I think we need to collaborate, and there's a lot of things that we need to do. So I, I think the first step of that is actually going out into those communities, and like so many people have said tonight, and actually listening to those people um, is the first step to that. Because if we're going to sit here and think that we know those solutions, that we're going to be sorely mistaken, okay? And then I think the second piece to, to that messaging is what I, what I talked about, too, which is we need to solve the problems that they have. I mean, I think we lost the suburbs. I think some of those... So the reasons we did is what does the suburban family care about? At least I know, I, I feel like I'm capable of answering that question considering I am a member of a suburban family. Is it care about taxes? Do we care about the schools that our kids go to? You know, we care about health care. So what's the solutions for those? So many times the other side has a solution and we think it's wrong, but again, our solution is we just, you can't have any of that. And it doesn't mean that we, government needs a solution, but we need to have messages and explain how our principles solve those problems. And we need to have short, concise messages that reach people and that mean something to individuals. And I think, again, I, we've got to listen and take that message directly to the people. The ground game that we had in so many uh, uh, parts of the state and in two and three need to take, we need to take those same messages in the city and continue doing things uh, like Jim has done in that, in that outreach in the Metro. Um, again, that's something I've been working on for a number of years. Uh, this past uh, uh, cycle, um, we introduced uh, the. We have a tent, and we introduced these new these panels uh, in the tent. And w one of them is um, every child deserves a chance, which is basically a derivative of the party message from years or over the past years. We had um, shared values, shared future with a Latino theme to it, mm -hmm. and we had um, uh, every uh, something about people b building businesses and so on and pursuing their American dream. Our parade float also talks a lot about um, patriotism. Republicans are patriotic, and that's, those are marketing uh, types of things that we've been working on. We also, in previous cycles, uh, when we were doing the, the parade float, uh, the, the first one, or actually the second one, was, uh, um, again, patriotic. We had the flags um, and so on. It was a little less elaborate than the new one, but, but that's part of what we should be doing and extending that into things uh, like community advertising, um, is one of the areas I'd, I'd like to do. Uh, I've, uh, social media is something where we really need to get in there and really drill into uh, places where, where they, people hang out in social media, like, again, Facebook or wherever. And then I think we also need to do something with getting into community organizations. You know, with a lapel pin that says, I'm a Republican, I speak for the party. That's kind of one of the ideas that I haven't done anything with, but I'd like to see, a, some, see us do something with, is to, is to start talking as Republicans at things like the Chamber of Commerce, Knights of Columbus, wherever it is we happen to be. So, time up. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Could you, could you restate once? I can read both of them. Yeah. Okay. What do you feel is the best way to market the Republican conservative brand towards urban voters? Yep. What marketing strategies do you believe we need? How will you develop messages? Right. So, both of these guys have some really good points. Four and five, no, no surprise. Um, there is, however, another step I think that we need to do, and it's it's not just being there, but really digging in, really going with intentionality to listen with an open mind, to listen with an open ear, um, and that that can be that can be our urban our urban voters that we're losing come in many different forms. Um, we all know that. Um, but I really want to commend Barb Sutter for some work she did just in the past couple days, um, sitting on a panel at the Urban League, um, having discussions with our North Minneapolis community. I didn't know that I, as a white person, could be a member of the NAACP. That changed on Monday. Um, and they were really excited to see several of us Republicans there, listening, 
not to speak, not to share what we're doing, and that's not how you message develop. I've worked with the independent expenditure organizations to message develop in our competitive races, in our suburban donut. That sometimes takes polling and focus groups and all the other tools that I've worked with that I know we can work with in the future. But first and foremost is developing relationships of trust by being there, by listening with an open ear. And it's only at that point that I think you can start speaking effectively on behalf of the party to share our visions into those communities that have, they, they center around family, they center around the church. And with that, I'm done. And that is true, and we've known that for quite a while, that those who show up are the ones that we vote for. Because it, to them, it means that you, you care about them. And it, it really makes a big difference. But let me go back to community outreach, not about what you're going to do, but all three of you have done some community outreach. Has there been any data collection on anything? Like, did you, you know, were any phone numbers, uh, names taken? Was there any follow-up to see if they were going to, if they needed more info, if they wanted to get more involved? Um, is there any data showing voter movement to the Republican Party with any of these efforts that have been done so far? And I think we're, we're rotating, so let's... That would be you, yeah. Um, short answer is no, because it's a federal crime. Uh, if the FEC regulations basically prevent you from doing too much in voter um, uh, data collection in the tent, uh, because it's a it's a called Federal Election Activity, FEA, and it's... Um, uh, you have to pay for that kind of activity with federal dollars, and federal dollars are harder to come by. Now, the, um, uh, the way we have gotten around is we have affiliates and local party units do, you know, and kind of working around outside the tent, but never working into the tent. And uh, actually, the CFB, the Campaign Finance Board, says that from their point of view, that's fine. There's no problem with it. And because uh, uh, it, it came up in last Cinco de Mayo a year ago. Um, as far as what's effective and what's not effective, um, I'm a, okay, I'm a real serious numbers guy. I've done you know, my 20, 30 years of hardcore research into electric power markets. I don't see a way to do the research. I have a political science degree. I don't see any way to get really good data and really good analytics that, that pass any kind of reasonable muster on this. We just have to, it's a, it's a lot of, sh uh, of, of shoot and go and do our best and, and see what, we, what happens, what works with, with campaigns. And that's something, I think I may have, may have misled a little bit. Um, my work is not just in urban core. I've worked in suburban campaigns where we win and lose and have managed uh, two state senate races that both ended up being targeted. So it's uh, um, one of them we won, one we lost. But uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a, um, it, it, as far as what's effective and what's not effective, we just have to go by our instincts as to what that, what's involved with there. And that takes experience. I think all three of us have. Yeah. Very good. Um, yes, I've, I've, I've done data collection, but also looking at the data um, with respect to these communities. Um, the, the data collection is probably your most effective, and that's going to be through surveys. It's going to be through asking, again, starting the conversation, asking the question, because also in the, this isn't as big of a problem in rural Minnesota with, with our native population. There, however, there is still a lot of mobility on the reservation. I've done work with campaigns going into the reservations, which are really a DFL stronghold at this point, frankly because the Democrats are always there, and we are not. Um, that's led it to be a stronghold. And I've done some work with candidates <coughs> to do some data work. I really have enjoyed the work actually that I've done across rural Minnesota with the Hispanic and Somali communities in pockets, in, 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 in enclaves. All around, all around rural Minnesota, whether it's whether it's you know Wilmer or uh, or or Fairbow or down in Rochester, I've had some really wonderful conversations with Somali Chamber of Commerces that can provide us with that data. Um, and so it's not just the data that we have as the party from voter ID data and the data that we can collect from those conversations, but we can also build partnerships. And to the extent that the law allows, the party can acquire some of that data from friendly uh, from friendly allies. Uh, so, as fifth CD chair and uh, helping on Jennifer Zelensky's campaign, we definitely did a lot of outreach stuff and a lot of, uh, you know, door knocking and lip dropping and other kinds of things. And we definitely collected data and, and 
I'm proud to say that we had an impact. A lot of people, and, and to, the, to the kudos of the, the get out the vote for the state party, the state from 2014 to 2018, uh, as far as measurable results, went increased the voter, the Republican voter turnout by over 25%. Uh, you know, it was almost like a presidential year, right? Um, not quite, but pretty close. And in the fifth CD, uh, proud to say that we increased the Republican voter turnout by 35%. And so we outpaced the state, and Jen actually got almost 9% more than Trump. And you might think that's because Trump's vote was suppressed, but not true. Trump got more votes than Mitt four years before. So we proved that showing up and talking to those individuals and working in those communities and knocking on doors and dropping lit worked. And we would love to have more people coming into the metro helping us do those, those efforts in the city. So we definitely got those measurable results. Good. Okay. Starting with Kim. How will you increase the membership in the 25 to 40 age group? Very good. Um, this is an area of, of, of great passion for me. And I don't care who you are. It should be an area of great passion for you as well. Because this age demographic specifically is the future of our party. It is the future not only of our voters, but of our activists, of our volunteers, of the people who can knock doors and make phone calls, and the people who are going to eventually be the candidates on the bench to become our next legislators to advance our principles at the legislature and in their local towns and municipalities. How will we do this? It's a lot like outreach to other communities that Republicans don't speak well to. Sometimes you have to go talk with them. Sometimes you have to listen pretty well. And our party, I think, could use a reimagining, a re repackaging of those wonderful principles that we have to sell to pitch them to the people that are now paying taxes. It's really great to sell socialism to people that are living off their parents and as they go into college who are living with all expenses and all needs cared for. And it is at exactly that, that moment when they first collect, start collecting a paycheck that we need to intercept them. It is exactly at that moment when we need to leverage our data, our good data that we do have statewide, and the models that we have. We can be outreaching proactively, but we can do that at the local level too. And that's one of the trainings I would love to deliver on a statewide basis to our local organizations. How do you bring those folks into your, into your organizations so you don't turn them away, and then continually develop them to be your next bench? Thank you. Jesse. The, the to, we need to talk to them about the issues they care about. I feel like I repeat myself, but it's because the, the, I'm a big believer in that basics work and get things done, right? Do the basics really, really well. And, you know, we've got to accept the fact that, that the younger generation has got student loans that are out of control. They're buying houses later in life. They are getting married and having kids later in life. Why? Because they can't afford to. And we've got to accept that that's a problem and if our party doesn't have a solution that solves those problems for those people, I go back to my joke. If we want to turn them Republican faster, get them a mortgage and a couple of kids. And, you know, so those are the things. If we allow people to get a good job and, ha and have a family and do those things, those are things that, uh, that are Republican values and that are American values and have to be able to live that dream. So we need to solve those problems. So it's the same as that we've all been talking about in outreach to those communities. We've got to go talk to those people, we've got to listen to those people, and we've got to show how our principles fix the problems of our society. Thank you. Um, that's a very unfair question, because obviously, I, with the bifocals and the gray hair, I am not in that age cohort, and even my kids are starting, they're almost ready to age out of that. Uh, the, um, one of the things I think, if we step back and take a look at this from an historical uh, point of view, I'm a boomer, and when I was that age, you know, when I was 25 years old, the world was going, the Republican Party was dead as a doornail, it was a rotting corpse. And it was, you know, it was, there was concerns about the United States becoming a one-party country. Well, that didn't happen. We came back, and we came back because people grew up. Boomers grew up and realized, got their mortgage, got their kids, and moved forward with their lives and realized, well, this Democrat stuff really is a bunch of BS, and we, we can't do it. We can't pay for it. And um, so I think we should have uh, more confidence in our principles and values 
and uh, moving forward, but we have to find ways of packaging those in ways that are going to be palatable to folks that are um, younger and coming of age. And as they come of age, they need to be hearing us at the time when they're starting to question uh, their allegiances to the uh, Democrats and, and the left and, and all the stuff that they were taught in, in, in college. So um, uh, we should move forward with confidence, but we also should, again, do our, do our job in terms of com communicating with younger folks that um, um, you know, maybe you should, maybe it is time to grow up and move out of your parents' basement and have a couple of kids and stuff. I, I wish my, someone would teach my, or tell my kids that, um, that, that uh, you know, time, that the clocks are ticking, so. That's your job. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's a sore point. Um, there's really only three more questions left, and I can actually roll four of these index cards into one topic. So we're gonna start with you, Jesse, and it has to do with training and support for activists. Um, what plans do you have for BPOU training and support when it comes to finding candidates, building them, and what will you do for Minneapolis and St. Paul area campaigns? So you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but so, let's be more specific. Yeah, first of all, I think my experience in training, and in, in, uh, I mean, I've been a regional trainer for large corporations. I have had the pleasure of training hundreds of people, and so I've written training programs, done all that kind of stuff as part of my career. And so I think I bring a lot of those skill sets to the table to be able to do those things. I, I'm, the big picture, I mean, we, like you said, we've touched on a lot of this stuff already, but the big picture is that, um, that it, it comes down to sharing the best practices throughout the enterprise. And there are so many already great tools out there. I don't think I need to come and reinvent the wheel. I think the first step, and I think it was Kip who talked about this earlier, or maybe it was just at another event and I heard whatever, but about going out and, get, and really take, taking an inventory of what's out there, right? And going and talking and meeting with all of the activists all around the state and gathering those best practices and information. And I think the deputy chair is a good spot to be able to kind of the funnel, if you will, to put those things together and be able to share those information. I also know one of the other programs that I'd love, to, a little bit of a mentorship program. I've talked to so many BPOU leaders that would love to be a mentor to another BPOU and have some phone calls or coffees or whatever and work on those and build those relationships and help each other out. So I think there's so many different programs that we can do to, to, to help everybody help each other. It's not that I've got to go around and do every one of those trainings, again, multiply ourselves, and you guys already know a lot of the, the, the best practices, and you can help train all of those local activists and those local candidates, which I think is another area of training, but I'm out of time, that we need to spend a lot of time in, which is helping those candidates with a unified message. Jim. Um, there's nothing lonelier than being a campaign manager in a blue district. Uh, where you, you really want to do a good job. You never hear from people. Re phone calls are from the caucuses are hard to get returned. You might get one meeting. I remember in, uh, in 2010, um, met with the caucus folks and they, we, we were told, no, we're not gonna help you. Um, and by the end of the, actually by the end of the summer, they flipped around and, and came in and, and we turned into a targeted race and, and eventually won it. But we were not supposed to be targeted. But there's nothing lonelier than that when you, if you don't know what to do. And with so many of the people that get into politics, they, they get their best friend or something like that who really doesn't know much about politics, and they, they, they flounder around, and by the time you get to the end of September, maybe they've got a clue. And by then, it's too late to put forward in a reasonable, uh, good um, uh, effort. What I'm hoping to do is to uh, systematize the training on that so that when those decisions are made, that within a, a few days or a week, these, these folks can get up to speed. Part of that is through reference manuals, through training um, documents, um, through live uh, uh, training sessions, if that's how you want to learn, but also through uh, computer and web-based training. Um, actually, I've been looking into that, um, have been, had been looking into that, and I'm still doing it for my business in terms of training people on electric power markets. And so uh, that material can, that, that those structures can easily be adapted for uh, training on politics, where if you've got someone who can do computer-based training, we can do it. And someone can figure out in a couple of days of uh, sitting at a terminal, going through, lectures and slide, slideshows and so on, what they need to do and when they need to do it. And I think that's where we need to, uh, where I would take us in, in terms of this, uh, our efforts in with your question, regarding your question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do want to say I'm very confident in, in aspects of the experience of that, all three of us on this, on this issue. Um, I come from, a, come, a, come from a political training perspective where this is my experience, not necessarily in a corporate environment where I'm cutting their paycheck. 
um, but where but where I'm encouraging people to show up to these trainings to keep them around to keep them engaged um, and this is something I've been very passionate about and doing on the ground with with volunteers all across the state um, since 2012 um, in, in, in well since 2014 in 2014 I set up a little company to start developing this idea called force multiplier and it was based on the concept of the military concept of a force multiplier where you come in and you train and then you train other people to train and you use those resources and tools to go out and win the field of battle um, and and based on that I've been doing this for campaigns for, for political organizations all across the state with many of you even um, and I have also been in the course of this period of time not just developing what I want to do as deputy chair, which is an in-person training once a quarter with each with each local unit. Whether that's going to your just going to your unit once a quarter, whether that's meeting in person with your executive leadership organization once a quarter, or whether that's providing a training that you want on the ground once a quarter, I'm committing myself to that in the full-time capacity. I'm also doing what Jim mentioned. Developing already a base of a base of media from all of my political activities. I film the operation I've already been creating these videos that I can go out and then provide in a digital platform for these trainings That's about it that I that's all I can fit into this right now <laughs> That's good. Well, that's good. We'll start with Jim. What salary compensation will you be seeking and um, when they get to you, Kip, there's a, um, an additional question. So if you don't address it, then I'll ask you. Sure. But otherwise, just, just address your salary and compensation that you're seeking. Um, this is, the answer to this is, is, again, complicated by the fact that we, or you don't get what you ask for. You get what they'll give you. <laughs> and it, that, that's been a bone of contention over the you know, years I've been involved at the congressional district level of the, the party. It's always been a con an area of contest. In fact, this is the first time with uh, with uh, Pasco that it really hasn't been a real you know uh, knockdown drag out. Um, what I'd like to do is full time. Uh, I will settle for whatever can be done. Um, uh, if it's if there's no compensation, it's going to limit what I can do. I'm not a rich man, so I can't just donate a, a lot of time and, and resources to this uh, like I am with my with my pack. There's only so much you can do with uh, you know uh, on the side. If I'm working full time, then um, my business interests I can set aside. Or you know, uh, sh uh, um, short sale them, short drift them, and uh, um, move forward with uh, uh, with minimal kind of uh, effort on that. So, what do I want? I'll, uh, it's uh, uh, for compensation. I'd love to do full time. I will do half time. Whatever it takes to, to get the job done. So, and I think that's a good point too, because I think everybody kind of thinks part part time, full time, but in reality, you're all going to work for whatever it takes. So, probably. Okay, Kim. I'm running as a full time deputy chair. Um, I think that we need to move in this direction in terms of the time that we need to commit to building this organization. That's the main reason why I'm doing it. Um, I, I, I don't think we can afford not to. In terms of compensation, I'm asking $60,000, 5K a month. That has been the number since the beginning. It's, uh, it's a number that I am confident, looking back at past, uh, past compensation negotiations, people have come back and asked for more. No one's going to get rich working for the party, um, but this is a number that I'm confident I can ask for and then not seek an increase. It's also a number that I'm confident that with my own personal network, from, from my alumni network as well as from the network of personal uh, business contacts that I have and donors that don't currently contribute to the party who encourage me to run in, under, this, under this regime, I'm confident, very confident that I can raise this myself without stepping on anyone else's toes. Um, I'm confident that I can bring that money to the table and uh, and probably based on the fact that I want to focus on increasing our Century Club which is our hundred dollar donors by leveraging some data stuff that I'm happy to talk to you about in, in, the, in the future I want to increase that dramatically I'm pretty confident that uh, it's going to be a net positive far in advance of that but it's something that we need to do full-time if I may, then I will follow up sure. just for this question, if you don't mind. It says you indicated that you will be seeking a full-time salary. Correct. And you would also serve as political director? Uh, so that was in discussion with, with the chair and with Kevin, okay. um, that this would be a way to approach it, to make the political director option a full-time role. Um, when, it, when we were initially discussing uh, not necessarily an outside raise, 
and I believed that I could definitely serve in the political director role very effectively, and that would defray the cost of having a full-time political director. I think it's a role that's crucial for off-cycle races so we can work on the ballot initiatives and special elections that happen all the time as the party. Um, but I'm happy to take on most of those responsibilities. At a future time, we might find a political director who can fill that role very effectively full-time. But I think we need, as the party, what do we exist for? We exist to win. We exist to win politically. The party needs a political director. Um, I, I could take over a lot of that role. Not as title political director. Um, I'd, I'd still be serving in my capacity as an elected officer on the executive board. Um, I'm sorry if there's any confusion there. No, no, it it's just, just it would, yeah, yeah. And then what would you do if neither of the requests are approved, if you don't get a full-time salary or if you don't serve as director? So. Uh, no, the, so the political director thing was off the table. Uh, that, that was just okay. contextualizing what I want to do as a full time okay. deputy okay. chair. Okay, it was yep. just an additional question. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to answer. Well, thank anytime. you for answering. Okay, yeah. Jesse. Uh, so I would request the the continuation of the same salary that Mr. Pasco has, the twenty thousand dollars, which I consider a defraying of some basic costs or whatever. Uh, the beauty of my um, current position is I work for I work out of my home basically. Um, and other than about four or five meetings a year, I don't have to be anywhere at a specific time. And I already travel around our great state and have stores in every uh, congressional district but one. Sorry, CD1. I don't have any locations down in CD1. Uh, but I, so I already get to travel around the state, and so I have. I'm already doing those things. So it kind of gives me the ability to do part time, like you, you know, part time with a full time effort. People have that capacity, but. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree, Kev. I, actually, I was going to ask you, I thought we were getting rich out of this deal. Oh. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be somewhere else. <laughs> okay. How well, do the Democrats seem to always get rich from yeah. being in office? Yeah. Here, if, you, if I can interrupt for a second. I'm yeah, gonna please do that. Yeah, we've got sure. uh, two questions here that I'm going to combine as one again, and it really is our last questions on here. We can go into the audience if you'd like. Um, two questions. So one came from a text message and, and one from the audience here. How will you work with the other GOP officers? How will you work with them? And how able are you to coexist with party activists who may publicly despise you? <laughs> wow. That me you want to answer that question? <laughs> Going first, by the way, I lost track. I, I, Is it Jim? I don't I'll know. Remember. It won't go I'll take it because right. it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, as far as uh, the, the current group of people either running for office or on the current board, I think I have a pretty good working relationship with, just, with everybody that's there. Um, it's certainly cordial. It may not always agree, but I think, I think it works fine. There's a number of folks out there that, a number of issues where I am adamant that we have to uh, change our ways. One is our um, specifically our. Uh, uh, welcoming of, well, certain minority groups, in particular Muslims. Um, Muslims make up about 70 to 100,000 votes in the state, and they are universally voting Democrat, and they, for some reason, are voting against, are voting in favor of principles and values that they detest. So we must be really bad if we can't get them to vote with us at least at this, uh, um, in significant uh, numbers. Um, and part of the reason why is because we have a lot of our activists who are, who are uh, very vocal in their anti-Muslim activities. I understand a lot of people have a lot of misgivings about Islam. I'm one of them. But we also have to learn how to work with them. They are here. They are not going anywhere. They're citizens and we're not going to deport them. There's not going to be any big ships taking them back to wherever it is they came from. Not going to happen. And um, I've known um, many Muslims over a long period of time. Probably I've tallied it up at about 30. Muslim, uh, almost all of them men. And uh, they're just fine individuals. Universally, I've had a great experience with them, not just in politics, but in business. And uh, you know, I'm in the energy sector, and there's a lot of Muslims that, that tend to gravitate towards that, towards that sector. And they're, uh, actually, if you want to say anything about them, they are universally honest, universally uh, uh, high levels of, of business level integrity. And uh, so um, I think I would expect that to be the case in, in all their dealings, again. We all have misgivings about this uh, this group that you know dresses strange and believes in strange things and uh, uh, by all accounts believes in things that are pretty vile, uh, at least what people think they are. But uh, again, the Muslims I know, you start from their point of view and work down through their their um, thing. Now that's how will I work with them? I'll simply ask them to you know, please be quiet, you know, keep your misgivings to yourself if you're going to be in the party. Yeah. 
I think we had two components, party officers and then, and then activists, right? Um, I believe I have a very good working relationship with everybody on the executive committee. Um, everybody is newly elected as well. I, I know I've, I, although I've not served on the executive committee, uh, directly I have served on congressional executive committee and I've worked with everybody on executive committee extensively. Um, I know that I have a unique ability to work with difficult personalities. Whether that is in the roles that I'll be serving with, or whether that is with activists, with delegates, with candidates, with people on the other side. It's being able to work through a process like that is something I've always been good at. Working with people that I don't necessarily get along with or agree with. Um, but then being able to come together as one unit, in the case of the executive committee, once a decision is made, pull arm in arm with a unified force towards the direction the decision has been made. I'm not going to go around backstabbing. We've seen that in other a uh, couple cycles ago, deputy chair chair relationships. <laughs> Definitely would not be the case. I know that I can work very effectively with Chair Carnahan or whoever is elected. Um, also with local activists, I like mending bridges as quickly as possible. It, having good, solid, on the, on the ground relationships are crucially important. It's one of the reasons why I'm running full time. I want to be in touch with people all across the state before stuff boils over. And when I started running for this race, I went specifically to the people with whom I may have had the more strained relationships to work those out so that we can move forward on an arm and win. Thanks. Jesse. I, uh, well third, I think, because I think we actually all do, uh, have good working relationships with a lot of members of the executive uh, uh, committee, and having served on it, I have been able to work with those individuals and could work, and I have existing relationships with some of the other people running as well. So, um, I, I'm not worried about that. And uh, the, uh, as far as people, relationships with people that don't, sorry, relationships with people that don't, uh, or despise you, I think was the word, I'm a bunch of people's boss. Who do you think they go and complain about when they go home to their spouse, right? Me. So uh, I certainly am not under any impression that I, uh, I'm going to be everybody's favorite or am everybody's favorite. But I think that there's an ability to work with people that even that you disagree with and being able to build those relationships. And I've proven over my career and in politics and in corporate America to be able to mend those relationships and work with people that I don't always see eye to eye with. And uh, I think that the deputy chair role is kind of an interesting role and in the fact that, kind of like vice president, your job constitutionally is entirely to take over for this person if they die. Um, that there's, it's an interesting dynamic relationship uh, and that I think uh, Kip just mentioned about when the decisions made going forward, right, all on the same team, that in corporate America, being a middle manager for 20 years, it's been that way. I, I will fully express, and I would do the same thing as deputy chair, my opinions and my thoughts and what a disagreement and take the message from the people and from the field. But at the end of the day, when the decision's made, I'm on the team and I've, I've worked that dynamic of a relationship before and I will go forward with a unified voice as a party. Yes or no, you support the endorsement process? Yes. Um, Yes. <laughs> it's not. It, it's not. It's not sacred. However, it, I, 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 um, it's not a sacred thing. But yes, I, uh, I support the endorsement process uh, wholeheartedly. Yes. 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 All right. On April twenty seventh, one of you will become the deputy chair of the state party. The other two, will you be supportive? Of course, you will, and of the new chair. Sure. Yeah, you, get, you three have really worked together, and it's really been a joy seeing you out and about, and I want to thank you for being here. Does anybody have an additional question for these gentlemen? So along the lines of um, working with other party officials, and if this is not a fair question, feel free to say it's not fair, but um, I find that the chair and deputy chair um, relationship and partnership is really important. So, have you uh, been on record endorsing any particular chair candidate? Yeah. My answer: No, I haven't endorsed any of the three. Yeah. 
I've said that uh, short of an endorsement, I am supporting uh, Jennifer Carnahan as I did uh, in the first, I was one of the first five to support her when she ran the last time. And that's been really helpful for our relationship to be one of trust going forward. Uh, but not an endorsement for the reason you mentioned. Right. Jesse? I have been fully in support of Jennifer Carnahan for re-election. Anyone else have a question for these guys? Um, what endorsements by like different groups and stuff like that have any of you guys received, um, whether it be affiliate groups or other groups that have endorsed for deputy chair? What endorsements have you received yep, from yep, other yep, okay. yep, Just wait, waiting to be called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, I have been endorsed. Uh, I'm t thinking about the ones that are announced. Um, I've been endorsed by the Young Republicans. Um, which I'm very, very thankful for. As far as, uh, there are few groups that are endorsing in this race, um, but that is one that they offered an endorsement. I've been endorsed by them. Um, I have very, very good, relation, good working relationships with other people short of that, short of that are not endorsing. But as far as endorsements are concerned, I think that's the one that I'm aware of. Unless, unless, no. are there are others. Okay. <laughs> Jesse? Yeah, I, I don't think there's been a lot of groups that have stepped up and endorsed anybody at this point. I haven't I haven't sought any group's no. endorsement either. Uh, so that's nothing at this time. No, I haven't sought any endorsements either. I'm, I don't actually believe in that as a tool, or at, this, at least at the deputy chair level. Maybe at the chair level it makes more sense. Or for, but I don't, uh, it, it don't intend to seek any endorsements. Okay. Anyone else? Didn't see the YR endorsement. Okay. They passed. Oh, hey, uh, when I come back next year, uh, can I come hang out at the office with whoever wins sometime? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Kip just reminded me I did seek the YR endorsement way back, uh, like in January, but yeah. About the, I realized that the, after I left it, this is stupid. I shouldn't have sought the endorsement. I just, I just needed to talk to these guys, but uh, but I did see. I technically did see. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for stepping up. It's not its not easy to run. It's, I mean, it's, it's just not. And some people really enjoy it, of course. And a lot of us are, you know, political junkies really love the arena, of course. And but thank goodness for us. Um, and uh, I just am really glad that you three stepped up. I'm so glad you were able to be here. And thank you to all of you to be here. True down. Thank you for Mary, being here. I think we have a one minute close. Oh, and you know what? They have a one minute close. <laughs> so we're going to go back to we'll keep it 30 seconds. I took you Okay, absolutely. Go. Go. You don't want? No, I mean, I'll do it. Go yeah, I'll do it. Go for it. If they want to do, a, if they want to do up to a one minute close. Okay, I'll, sure I'll be, I'll be way less than a minute. Quiet. So. I, thank you. You know, you mentioned the February meeting having bad weather. I think you kind of have a thing with doing events with bad weather because the one at your house too. I think I almost died driving up. <laughs> but uh, thank you again, Mary, for putting this on, and thank you guys for all coming. Reach out to me. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to activists, whether you're a state central delegate or not. Uh, my info's on there. But Jesse for MN, you can reach out. You can text me right through the website. Call whatever you want to do, and I just look forward to talking to all of you. And uh, I appreciate your support. Thank you. I wanted to thank you all for being here. This is really crucial that you were here to ask the questions so that we could do this forum and kind of see the comparisons between our candidacies. Um, I've been traveling all across the state, talking with our delegates and alternates in person, um, getting ready for what I, what I hope would be those in-person conversations to continue. Um, the nature of a format like this and of those conversations is that perhaps you don't get able to dig into the depths of some of the ideas that we have. That is unfortunate. However, if you want to check out some of my ideas that I've had published and have been advancing for several years, I have a podcast with Max Reimer, who you might know, called Kip and Max Save the World. Um, episode 44, I commend to each and every one of you. It's called Organize or Die. Also, with respect to, with respect to this campaign, episode 600 of Up and Adam, I discuss much more in depth my vision for the party and a lot of the things I wanted to do from the outset of this race. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for coming today and, and listening to us. Um, I'd ask you when we, all of us are going to be calling you and asking you to speak with you over the next couple of weeks to I'd ask you to take our call so that we can get a chance to, to explain what we're about. And uh, also let us know who, you know, so we have a pretty good idea when we go in, what to expect as far as voting. 
one of the, the difficult things about this race in particular is that nobody wants to hurt her feelings. Well, go ahead and hurt my feelings. I'm, uh, I'm not, I, I, you know, I, I've never been particularly concerned about that. Um, I would uh, wrap it up by saying that, um, reiterating, we need to do a much better job in places where we have done a lousy job, terrible job, over the past 20 years. Not something that's, that's new, it's something that's an old problem that goes back uh, many, many cycles. And um, uh, that's something that I've been trying to tackle, I'm in the process of doing it, and uh, want to continue that over, the, over uh, if I win, over my term. And even if I don't win, I'm gonna be still doing it. I just have a lot more, um, I, can get, I can get a lot more done as deputy chair than without being deputy chair. So that's my final words. Yeah. All right, thank you. Are we, are we going to do one of these? <laughs> 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 do you do that one?